Chapter Nine of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Chapter Nine The Intellectual Side of Horse Racing. Horse racing, or at least betting, is one of the few crafts that are looked down upon by practically everybody who does not take part in it. It's a mug's game, people say. Even betting men talk like this. There is a street called Mugs Row in a north of England town. It is so called because the houses in it were built by a bookmaker. Whether it was the bookmaker or his victims that gave the street its name, I do not know. To call a bookmaker a mug would seem to most people an abuse of language. Yet the only bookmaker I have ever really known used to confess himself a mug in the most penitent fashion. He was a mug, however, not because he could not make money, but because he could not keep it. The poor of his suburb, when in difficulties, he declared, used always to come to him instead of going to the clergy, and he was unable to refuse them. But then he was bitter against the clergy. As a young man, he had been a Sunday school teacher, and so far as I could gather, he might have gone on being a Sunday school teacher till the present day if he had not suddenly been assailed with doubts one Sabbath afternoon as he expounded the story of David and Goliath. Whether it was that he had looked on David as having taken an unsportsmanlike advantage of the giant, or whether he doubted that so much could be done with such little stones, he did not make quite clear. Anyhow, from that day on, he never believed in revealed religion. He quarreled with his clergyman. He broke the Sabbath. He began to drink beer and to go to race meetings. He rapidly rose from the position of carpenter to that of bookmaker. And, were it not for his infernal gift of charity, he would probably now be driving his own car and be hallmarked with a coalition title. Even as it was, he was much more prosperous than any carpenter. Whenever he produced money, it was in pocketfuls and handfuls. Strange that a bookmaker, who by his trade must be accustomed to miracles, should find it difficult to believe in David and Goliath. He was possibly a man who betted on form, and on form Goliath should undoubtedly have won. David was an outsider. He had no breeding. He would have been surprised if he could have foreseen how his victory would rankle some thousands of years later in the soul of an honest English bookmaker. It is, however, just these matters of form and breeding that raise horse racing and betting above the intellectual level of a game of nap. Betting men who ignore these things are as unintellectual as the average novelist. There are some, for instance, who shut their eyes and bring down a pen or pencil on a list of names of the horses, in the hope that this way they may discover a winner. No doubt they may. It is perhaps as good a way as any other. But there is something trivial in such methods. This is mere gambling for the sake of excitement. There is no more fundamental brain work in it than in a game I saw being played in a railway carriage the other day. When a man drew a handful of coins from his pocket and bet his friend half a sovereign that there would be more heads than tails lying uppermost. This is a game at which it is possible to lose five pounds in two minutes. It is the sort of game to which a betting man will resort when an extremis, but only then. The ruling passion is strong, however. I have a friend who, on one occasion, went into retreat in a Catholic monastery. Two well-known bookmakers had also gone into temporary retreat for the good of their souls. My friend told me that even during the religious services, the bookmakers used to bet as to which of the monks would stand up first at the conclusion of a prayer, and that in the solemn hush of the worship, you would suddenly hear a hoarse whisper, two to one on Brownie, a brother with hair that color, and the answer, I take you, Joe. I have even heard of men betting as to which of two raindrops on a window pane will reach the bottom first. It is possible to bet on cats, rats, or flies. Calvinists do not bet, because they believe that everything that happens is a certainty. The extreme betting man is no Calvinist, however. He believes that most things are accidents, and the rest catastrophes. 
hence his philosophy is almost always that of epicurus to him every day is a new day at the end of which it is his aim to be able to say like horace fixi or as the text ought perhaps to read vici the intellectual betting man on the other hand has a position somewhere between the extremes of calvinism and epicureanism he worships neither certainty nor chance he reckons up probabilities when mr asquith picked out spy on cop as the winner of the derby he did so because he went about the business of selection not with a pen or a pencil but with one of the best brains in england in the course of his long conflicts with the house of lords he had probably interested himself somewhat profoundly in questions of heredity and pedigree and he was thus well equipped for an investigation into the records of the parentage and grandparentage of the various derby horses all that the ordinary casual better knows about spy and cop is that he is the son of spearmint which won the derby in nineteen o six this however would not alone make him an obviously better horse than orpheus whose sire orby won the derby in nineteen o seven the student of breeding must be a feminist who pays as much attention to the female as to the male line it was by the study of the female line that the most cunning of the sporting journalists were able to eliminate tetratema from the list of probable winners tetratema as son of the tetrarch was excellently fathered for staying the mile and a half course at epsom more than this as a writer in the sportsman pointed out the tetrarch himself is by roy herodi a fine stayer and his maternal grandam was by hegioscope who rarely failed to transmit stamina it is when we turn to tetrema's mother scotch gift or is it his grandmother something else apparently that we discover his hereditary vice this mare our journalist exposed to scathing and searching criticism and concluded that there can be nothing unreasonable in the inference based on the records of this family that the chances are against a derby winner having descended from the least distinguished of four sisters even so however the writer a few sentences later abjures calvinism and denies that there is anything certain in what he calls breeding problems it seemed he writes wildly improbable at one time that flying duchess would produce a derby winner for i believe that it is correct that two of gallopin's elder brothers ran in a bus and there were two others quite useless so on the face of it the chances were against gallopin the younger brother i quote these passages as evidence of the immense demand the serious pursuit of horse racing puts on the intellect the betting man must be as well versed in precedence as a lawyer and in the genealogical trees as a historian at school i always found the genealogical trees the most difficult and bewildering part of history yet the genealogical tree of a king is a simple matter compared to that of a horse all you have to learn about a king is the names of his relations regarding a horse however you must know not only the names but the character staying power and domestic virtues of every male and female with whom he is connected during several generations if a man spent as much labor in disentangling the cousinship of the royal families of ancient egypt he would be venerated as a scholar in five continents oxford and cambridge would shower degrees on him sir william sutherland would get him a place on the civil list hence it seems to me that tipping the winners is not as is too often regarded anybody's job it is work that should be undertaken only by men of powerful mind no man should be allowed to qualify as a tipster unless he has taken a degree at one of the universities the ideal tipster would at once be a great historian a great antiquary a great zoologist a great mathematician and a man of profound common sense it is no accident that an ex-prime minister was one of the few englishmen to spot the winner of the derby of nineteen twenty mr asquith must have gone patiently through all spy on cop's relations weighing up the chances whether it was an accident or owing to the weather that such a one fifteen years ago was beaten by a neck in a six furlong race studying incidents in every one of their careers 
seeing that none of them had ever had a great uncle or bus horse bringing out a table of logarithms to decide difficult points we need not be surprised that there are fewer great tipsters than great poets shakespeare alone has given us a portrait of the perfect tipster looking before and after in apprehension how like a god it is perhaps when we leave questions of breeding and come to those of form that we realize most fully the amazing intellectualism of the betting life in the study of form we are faced by problems that can be solved only by the higher algebra thus if jehoshaphat carrying seven stone ran third to jezebel carrying eight stone four pounds in a mile race and jezebel carrying eight stone four pounds was beaten by a neck by a woman in wine carrying seven stone nine pounds over a mile and a quarter and woman in wine carrying eight stone one pound was beaten by a tom thumb carrying nine stone in a mile hundred and twenty yards and tom thumb carrying nine stone seven pounds was beaten by jehoshaphat over seven furlongs we have to calculate what chance tom thumb has of beating jezebel in a race of a mile and a half on a wet day there are men to whom such calculations may come easy to mr asquith they are probably child's play for myself i shrink from them and if i were a betting man would no doubt in sheer desperation be driven back on the method of pen and pencil but it is obvious that the sincere betting man has to make such calculations daily every morning the student of form finds his sporting page full of such lists as the following zero 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 conclusive seven dash five kronstadt conclusion eighth of nine to poltava gave seventeen pounds gatwick may six f and seventh of nineteen to orby's pride received four pounds kempton may five f three 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 rapier seven dash four sunder guruli lost three dash four length and three lengths to bantry gave two pound and marcia received seven pound newmarket may one m golden guinea gave twenty pound not in first nine see black jess zero zero four royal blue seven dash zero prince palatine china blue see northern light zero two zero black jess six dash eleven black jester diving bell not in first four to st quarantine gave twelve pound lingfield last week seven f here app seven f lost three lengths to victory speech received one pound rapier gave thirteen pound favorite length off zero llama six dash eleven Iser two laughing mirror nowhere to silver jug gave fifteen pound newberry app seven f is not a page of thucydides simpler is perseus himself more succinct or obscure our teachers used to apologize for teaching us latin grammar and mathematics by telling us that they were good mental gymnastics if education is only a matter of mental gymnastics however i should recommend horse racing as an ideal study for young boys and girls the sole objection to it is that it is so engrossing it might absorb the whole energies of the child the safety of latin grammar lies in its dullness no child is tempted by it into forgetting that there are other duties in life besides mental gymnastics horse racing on the other hand comes into our lives with the effect of a religious conversion it is the greatest monopolist among the pleasures it affects men's conversation it affects their entire outlook the betting man's is a dedicated life even books have a new meaning for him the ring and the book it is his one and only epic and it is the most intellectual of epics that is my point End of chapter nine